Uh, ooh, yeah, thank you. Um, as John Andrew also said, I've been working with the wind power development in uh, in Norway for the past couple of years. Um, I'm project leader of a research council project called WindPlan, where we try to look at uh, the controversies of wind power planning in Norway and understanding a lot of the local responses. And in doing so, we found out in the project very early that we need to understand the the policy conditions for wind power development. We need to understand what drives policy, uh, wind power policies in Norway uh, and why the resistance is emerging um, in order to, to say something about how can we improve these policies? How could they be done more just? So what I'm going to speak about today is um, somehow try first to set a scene about what is this energy transition all about and why is it controversial? Uh, and then I'll go into the research I've done uh, in Norway of, uh, of looking at uh, Norwegian energy policies and, and doing field work in several uh, Norwegian municipalities. And from that, trying to draw some lessons about what is it that Norwegian policies have tried to answer, what has been driving these policies, and my, my claim is that it's some kind of energy efficiency ideal and how they have been countered and resisted and have been questions around issues of what you could call energy justice aspects. So um, just to, to uh, take one step back, does it? I just wanted to to start with you know kind of why are we talking about energy and and you could say the threat of energy in our society. Martin Pascaletti, a geographer, just wrote a book about he called the threat of energy, where he tries to show how energy is kind of a, a threat in in all our societal and environmental doings, um, and a, very much associated to our understandings. Um, and also speaking to a global development uh, lecture, I just uh, wanted to bring in the sustainable development goals and to to kind of um, uh, bring about how energy is, is one of the goals, which is related to affordable, accessible, reliable and sustainable energy for all. But how energy is also coined within the sustainable development uh, agenda at a UN level as kind of a, a thread between all these uh, different sustainable development goals. And that's because energy in many ways connects to not only economic activities, uh, production, consumption of goods, uh, and energy as a, as a commodity or provision, uh, but also because energy is about shelter, it's about food, it's about warmth, it's about well-being, it's about all the social dimensions of the sustainable development goals. And then not least, energy is connected to climate, both climate emissions, but also climate mitigation measures. It's connected to land use, it's connected to, to resource use. So all the environmental aspects of the sustainable development goals. So energy is a really interesting, you could say both um, object and subject to study and work with when we're working with planning and development for a more sustainable world. Uh, and there can be many different ways of understanding what a sustainable world is all about. Not least, you can say that energy, as we speak now, is very unevenly distributed, both the production, the consumption, and not least the distribution of, of goods and consequences of energy in the world. And I didn't want to bring in too many slides, but, but um, you could see just the electricity asset, there's still around 700 million people in the world without daily access to energy. And a lot of those are concentrated, not uh, in the global north, but in, in the global south. So in many ways, I think that, that energy can be seen as, you know, a very important uh, perspective when we work with development as such uh, to bring in what, how energy is affecting this. And from there, you could say that the last 30 years, there has been this um, increasing push for 
more efficient development of renewable energy at all political levels. It means that both at international and national and local levels of, of government and institutions, there has been a push to develop more renewable energy. Um, and it has been seen as kind of a key that could, on the one hand, mitigate climate uh, change. So on the one hand, it can reduce emissions and it can and bring us forward on, on this uh, the Paris Agreement. But and on the other hand, it's uh, it's also seen as a way of creating growth, economic growth, uh, workplaces. So it's seen it as this key to decouple economic growth and climate change in a way. Um, as such, and, and in Norway, but also globally, renewable energy is then you know positioned or it's framed in a way as a as a way to to fuel green industrialization. We see it at the EU level with the new Green Deal, how energy becomes, you know, a core concept of bringing us into this low carbon emission society. It can be how to, for instance, fuel new factories, creating new batteries to create a low carbon transport sector, uh, hydrogen. So the whole idea of producing more renewable energy is framed in a sense that it will fuel a lot of other transitions, like power to X, um, that will bring us into this low carbon society and more electrified society. So we don't need fossil fuels. So this is a very strong push. The third, or the yeah, the third push is that since one year ago, we have seen a new renewed push for renewable energy, uh, especially in Europe, uh, but also worldwide. And now renewable energy transitions are also seen as a way to handle consequences of a war in, in Europe and energy deficiency. So the issue of energy security has gained a lot of leverage in energy dialogues this last year. And I will bring exactly this issue also back to a Norwegian context about how the idea of war and instability and energy deficiency can actually fuel new policy decisions about why energy transitions should happen fast. And energy transitions and happening fast is not just in Norway, of course. I just Today, it's about 12% of the world's energy use that is, comes from renewable resources or what we call renewable, like hydropower, wind, solar, and other renewables like bio-renewables. The uh, International Energy Agency, EIA, made a, made a report called, uh, that I just showed on the previous slide, this, uh, you know, step scenarios for a, a zero carbon, uh, zero emission society. And one of the figures that they show is that uh, if you take all the policies, international and national policies now, there will be uh, within the next uh, 30 years an increase in renewable energy, which will increase from 12%, as we have now, to around 70% of the world energy consumption. And it will be primarily within solar and wind energy. So these graphs up there, um, they show uh, the, 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 the policy scenarios uh, that are already in place in different countries about how much renewable energy will be implemented the next 20, 30 years. And that's a lot of energy. And although wind power and solar power are said to be most cost efficient, it's also very land intensive, you can say. It will have enormous consequences for the land use of our planet. And as I spoke to uh, the, the, some of the master students that were here previously, I've not worked in the global south, but I have a lot of colleagues that have uh, worked there. And of course, these energy transitions are very visible uh, across the globe. Um, if it's hydropower or solar power or wind power in, in Mexico or Egypt or Ethiopia, it has enormous land area consequences. It's a very efficient way of using solar power, for instance, a very efficient way of using wind power, 
definitely, and water power. But the question is how it also creates these new sort of social environmental controversies, conflicts. What are the conditions to develop these renewable energies? And what consequences does it create, not only for the environment, but also for the, the social conditions of a local community or a region or, or even nation? So for instance, with the, this uh, Ben Ban, which is the largest solar uh, plant in the world now, just opened in, in Egypt, the funding is from large external investors. Uh, Norfund is also part of that. But the discussions about how this should contribute to the broader development goals or to the well-being of people in the area is less discussed than how technically feasible it is or how economically possible it is. You can say that what I've been uh, working with is not understanding energy controversies in the global south. It's understanding energy controversies in the uh, in Norway and related to wind power. We've also looked into Denmark and, and Scotland to learn from cases that are seen as less controversial. So some of the questions that we have tried to ask ourselves is, what is the conflict about? How can you kind of disentangle this conflict? What, what lines appear uh, within ma materialities, but also immaterials understandings of how it affects a place? Uh, we have looked into whose values and opinions count in a process of defining and planning and developing wind energy. We have asked who has the right to participate in such process. And in a way, you could say we, we try to ask who wins and who loses in these energy transitions. So in many ways, it's trying to say that energy transition and the push for energy transitions for more efficient energy transitions is perhaps uh, necessary in a climate perspective, but it should not be limited to the technical side of it or the economic side of it. It needs to also take some of the broader and more fundamental social development questions into concern. So there's been a lot, a really growing amount of social scientific research that has looked into aspects of, of justice. Uh, Susanna Betel from Portugal, for instance, has worked a lot with, with how these conflicts and controversies exist and how how some of it is trying to be hidden uh, behind ideas of nimbyism, for instance. So she's criticizing ideas of nimbyism and ways of overcoming conflict uh, and saying there's a need for a more justice-aware policy. There's a need for a more repoliticized policy. That the development of energy is not something that we just do because it's naturally occurring or that we need to do this because of climate. It's a political decision where construction of energy will have consequences for other things. So it's a priority. And also repoliticization uh, re is a difficult word. Um, is about asking who will gain from energy transitions. So it's kind of trying to take the veil away from this um, climate mitigation uh, urge and say this is about energy. Renewable or not, uh, it's about energy. So that's why um, a lot of uh, social scientists uh, have worked with developing what they call a, a frame about en uh, energy justice, which builds a lot on the environmental justice uh, uh, literature and 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 theor as it has theoretical roots within environmental justice and climate justice, <clears throat> but it's been trying to develop some kind of um, framework to to analyze energy transitions, both locally and and globally. So one of the pillars in in this theoretical framework is the justice of recognition. It's related to 
asking in any energy transition, whose values are recognized, whose interests are recognized, and not least, and what is not taken into uh, account. And it's also looking at what kind of entities are affected by this energy transition. And are they then recognized as being affected? In this relation, you could say that in, in a Norwegian example, a very prominent example is the Sami perspectives on wind power in the Sami territories, where you could say that until the new, uh, there was a, a new court case on the Sami rights to oppose to wind power development. And until that court case, the Sami rights had been very little recognized in the procedures in Norwegian wind power. The second pillar in this framework of, of energy justice is distributional justice. It is trying to depict how goods and burdens are actually distributed in a local society, but it could also be uh, regional or globally. Uh, I'll come back to that. Um, but this addresses issues about who owns the energy transitions. Is it local people? Is it public ownership? Is it private ownership? Is it foreign ownership? Who owns it? And what are the conditions of ownership for an energy transition? It could also be about taxes. How's this energy taxed? Where does the tax go? Who can decide how to use taxes? Or it can be about more, you could say, more neoliberal uh, ideas about compensation. I mean, how do you compensate for energy transitions by, for instance, having a development fund or environmental fund or whatever? The last pillar that I will go into uh, of this framework is the procedural justice. Procedural justice uh, addresses, so to speak, the whole process and legal frameworks concerning energy transitions. So it's concerned by asking who has the right to decide, who has the right to opinion, participate, how are spaces of participation organized, uh, what is the transparency, um, so it's uh, concerned with uh, aspects of democracy, trust, trans, um, ac accountability, and, and transparency. And as I will come back to, these aspects has been, these three aspects have been really crucial in, you could say, the wind power policy development in Norway and in the rising opposition that has been here. So I will come back to that. I decided to, to just mention two other aspects of this energy justice framework that has been developed uh, uh, more. Uh, one is related to cosmopolitan justice and intergenerational justice, which is trying to look more on an international scale, how, how energy transition affects human beings across the globe in a cosmopolitical sense. Um, and intergenerational in a sort of temporal perspective, how will it affect future generations uh, also? And that has led to what you can call a whole system energy justice developed by, by Benjamin Sovacool. And I just shortly took uh, the figure here because I think that is where we need to go. Uh, wind power in Norway does not just affect one community or a nation. It also has, it has these scale uh, spatial scale uh, aspects that you need to consider at both local but also national and, and of course international level. And the other thing which is perhaps even more important is the temporal aspect. Uh, wind, I'm sorry, <laughs> wind power in Norway uh, is reliant of resources that comes from elsewhere and wind power in Norway will, after the windmills are taken down, still have effects on the territory. So there is something about the temporal justice of energy transitions that really needs to be considered. That has not been so um, visible uh, yet. So the reason that I'm bringing in this, uh, this framework is that it gives, it gives some good lines to think with when you're then trying to analyze 
uh, energy policies at a national level like the Norwegian. So what I'll do now is, is trying to tell you a story about how wind power policies in Norway has developed and then try to depict some of these, you could say, claims between energy efficiency as a driver of wind power development in Norway and this rising concern or questioning about energy justice that has arised in Norwegian wind power policies. In the very end, I'll try to maybe ask if there's something we can learn from other energy transitions in Norway or from other contexts that could create learning about what is a more just energy transition. So Norwegian wind power policies, where did they come from? I mean, Norway has a hundred year history of energy development and um, with hydropower in the beginning of the century and oil in the middle of the century, uh, we have a lot of energy in Norway. And hydropower as of now still is still about 90% of the uh, electricity consumed onshore in, in Norway. But in about 1998, the first goals of wind power development uh, appeared in a white paper uh, in Norway. And that was seen in relation to a Stoltenberg speech, um, a previous uh, prime minister, who said that the hydropower era was over. Hydropower, hydropower in Norway had been also very controversial. And there was a national agreement that uh, the remaining rivers should be left natural. And that kind of spurred the interest for wind power because Norway has some of the most efficient wind power resources if you want to look at how wind can be measured as a power. And it was said that uh, it could be a new important technology for the future energy production in Norway. That uh, spurred you know, new institutional arrangement um, the licensing authority NVE, the Norwegian Water and Energy uh, Department, created a wind power uh, licensing section. Uh, you got state subsidies. Those who wanted to invest in wind power in Norway would get uh, a big amount of money from Enova. Um, and over time, one it was found out that here there is a need for centralized government of energy development in, in Norway. So that was kind of the first way of policy development in Norway, um, making it, you could say, creating institutions to handle energy development. The second wave of policy development of wind power in Norway can be seen as a kind of more climate oriented wave. Now, when you re read the, the different um, uh, white papers in Norway and the, the, the green papers, the Norsk Offentlige uh, Utredning, you would see that wind power is now positioned as an important key to get Norway to the Paris Agreement, to the EU uh, Renewable Energy Directive. So wind power is certainly now becoming an, an, an entity that is seen as a... Um, as a technology that can efficiently or more efficient wind power uh, production in, in Norway was seen as a way of answering to different obligations that Norway had to the EU and to international um, commitments like the Paris Agreement. Uh, and not least, the climate policy themselves in Norway saw wind power as a way of creating business opportunity and green growth as well as mitigating climate change. So it's very interesting when you read these policies, how you could say the, the understanding of what wind power is changes. But it was also said that this needs, that the market needs predictable conditions. And uh, in 2011, uh, what they call the, the green certificate scheme uh, was introduced, which gives subsidies directly to market actors per produced kilowatt hour that invest in wind power in Norway. In 2019, a lot of actors in Norway said, okay, this is going to take off. You know, Now, a lot of investment will come to wind energy in Norway. We need to have some kind of central way of handling all these developments. 
we need to have some kind of holistic land management plan for Norway and wind energy. So the NVE made this uh, national frame uh, for wind power. And it was thought that this would you know, reduce conflicts and increase efficiency of wind power development. And as we have seen, we now have a lot of uh, wind power development, uh, especially along the coast of Norway, where the wind resources are, are strongest. And until 2015, you could say Norway was actually considered like a laggard. It was immature wind power country. It never took off. But until, uh, but, but, but the later years, uh, wind power really took off in Norway. Uh, and in 2019, uh, yeah, actually in 2021, um, uh, Norway had put up most wind power capacity in all of Europe in those years. Actually, in 2021, there was only three countries in the world that had put up more wind power energy than Norway, and that was Brazil, the US, and China, in absolute numbers, of course. So it was amazing. Wind power now contributes with uh, around 10% of the Norwegian energy consumption, so about 14 terawatts uh, a year. And the whole consumption of Norway, uh, the whole production of Norway is about 140, 50 a year. So in many ways, this story is a very, it's a policy success story about how goals of energy uh, efficiency have really worked. With the green certificates, with the more centralized licensing, and with the technology leap, we have seen that wind power in Norway has really increased. So it went from being very slow to having this steep uh, development increase in, in Norway. However, as a lot of people who have been in Norway for the past four or five years, this increase in wind power development also spurred kind of an upsurge of reactions not only in local communities, but also across local communities. So the different, this is just to show that, that there were a lot of, of the media uh, about wind power. Uh, and actually we had a student doing a, a media analysis and, and in 2019 alone, there were more than 5,000 articles in national and regional papers, not all the small papers, but which is, you know, a lot for this kind of uh, subject. So what we can see is that in around 2018-19, that uh, appears a tension between policy intentions and ideas of efficient energy transition, and you would say civil society and, and other groups. Um, and now I, I put this um, figure, but it will take a long time. But you could just to, what is it that people are, contestating with this wind power? What is it that people, uh, uh, why don't they want this energy transition? What is it wind power spurs of controversies in a local community? There are some material conflicts related to noise, visual impacts, the landscape, the biodiversity, and not least uh, economic and property values. Um, but also issues about public health, how it affects stress uh, and so forth. There are also a lot of immaterial conflicts that are not so easy to grasp, but are related to identity of a place, to the understandings of what a landscape, landscape should be, to more recreational values of the landscape, and not least to aesthetics, what is beautiful, what is not. And then you have issues of procedure. I would say that some of these have probably been the, some of the worst conflicts in Norway. In Norway, it's been criticized for having a lack of uh, local government because it's been centralized to a state authority. There's been a lack of public participation in the local communities. People have not known what was going on until it was already decided and dealt with. There's been building up an enormous mistrust to the uh, licensing authorities. 
not least because there's been some strong linkages between the licensing authorities and the developers in Norway. So for instance, one of the interviewees I, I interviewed was a mayor in a municipality in Norway, and she said she hadn't written to the Norwegian authority of licensing, NVE, and asked some questions about the wind power project. And then two hours later, she gets a mail from the developer of the project answering those questions. And then you start to question, who should you trust in this development? Who will be the state authority? Who will control the developer, if not the licensing authority? And the third thing is that in the Norwegian uh, projects, there's been a, a change. Often people would uh, apply for one uh, project and they would pass several years and the project actually realized would be completely different from what was decided. And that was within the policy recommendations of Norwegian government, okay. They were technologically neutral, it was said. The last uh, perspective to take uh, up here from the local perspective that was controversial is that people would say, how can it be that we experience all the burdens, but both the electrons and the economy of this wind energy goes to foreign ownership. Why should our nature be sacrificed for the sake of saving European climate goals? So these are quotes that I've been hearing when I've been interviewing people. People will also question the ownership. Who owns this wind power? People would question, do we need this electricity in Norway? For whom are we producing this? Uh, and they would ask about the taxes. Where does the taxes go? Is there any tax on wind power? And at that point of time, there was no taxation of wind power in Norway. And then the compensation issues. How should a small municipality know what to ask for, for a lot, from a large uh, developer? So this is what the conflicts were all about. And it it happened in, in different communities, but it also created a kind of, you could say, several level identity, uh, as Divine Wright has written about, between different municipalities or different communities in Norway. So people in different communities could relate to the same kind of uh, uh, experiences. And we saw in the... And around 2018, uh, both two national protest movements that became established just against wind power, Motwin, Tailwind, and La Naturen Leve, uh, Let Nature Live. But we also saw a mobilization of existing large NGOs that has a lot of uh, um, members, uh, like uh, DNT, like the Norwegian Trekking Association, uh, Naturvan Forbundel, as in uh, Friends of the Earth, and a lot of other, Sabima, etc. And these actually mobilized their members to protest against wind power across the country. So one of these uh, shows how DNT, or the Norwegian Trekking Association, actually got people to march across Norway against wind power in principle. We also saw a very polarized debate. It was difficult to even opinion about positively about wind power. Um, I would talk to mayors that would say, we cannot talk about this anymore. Mayors in Agda made, there were several mayors that made principal decisions against wind power. Not that they had a project in the municipality, but just to be certain that we will not discuss this, that all developers know that we have said no to wind power. This is a very, yeah, a radical response, you could say, to say no to something that's not even been suggested. And there was also, you could say, a radicalization of local protests. People were hampering uh, construction sites. There were death threats to NVE and to Trond Energy. It was, a, you know, it was really a heavy um, a resistance movement building up. Also, this uh, bus, Night of Inkraft, Jarte Natur, the Dream Team bus, was established as a bus that you, if you experienced a developer coming to your municipality, you could call this bus and they would come down and help you orchestra your resistance in your local municipality. They would help you put up banners. They would help you 
how should you react during a public meeting? Uh, they would all dress in black. Uh, there was a lot of these things going on that is, you know, it's a very uh, high leveled and very uh, well <laughs> played uh, resistance. Uh, and this, these other pictures are from a meeting in, uh, in, in Lillesand where um, more than 300 people gathered a Saturday to show their resistance across uh, the region of Agda against wind power. And there would be speeches uh, about how wind power was intruding in, in, in nature and in forests uh, and so forth. So in my analysis and in and, and, and some of the papers that I've been working on, one of the issues that I say is, what is this voice trying to say, this resistance? Um, is that people are saying that, that we need to discuss what are actually the arguments for wind power. It's not just about climate. It's not just about security. Uh, we need to discuss who should be accepted as, as other types of values. What about the values of the birds? What about the values of nature, biodiversity? What about indigenous rights uh, and so forth? So this resistance made a claim that we need to discuss what should be considered and what should be ignored when we are dealing with uh, wind power licensing in, in Norway. The other aspect was this distributional aspect that I've said. I mean, who owns and how is it taxed? Wind power in Norway came in as this technology that didn't have any tax related to it, as opposed to hydropower and petroleum. Hydropower has more than 80% tax and it has um, it has uh, conditions where you have to have a public ownership in large hydropower, at least not in the small scale. So it's questioning structural and, and regu regulative measures of, of ownership and taxes about wind power and knowing that had not been lifted up beforehand. And then the procedural justice. What should the role of the municipality be? At what level should the decision making be taken? Um, and who should decide what an environmental impact assessment should be about and who should carry it out? How can we trust a company's own environmental impact assessment if it's not controlled by an authority? So these emerging claims in 2019 actually really changed Norwegian policies. First, we saw that all licensing procedures were halted in 2019, which means that for the past three years, you have not been able to, um, to apply for wind power energy in Norway. That's also a pretty drastic political measure to take. Then they discarded this national frame. Then came a, a wind power white paper, the first in Norway, uh, which they called um, a historic instramning, a historical tightening of the licensing procedures, which changed a lot of the how you should apply the EAA um, and so forth. And as of this year, uh, they have now put in a new tax regime. Um, it's just been put in a tax regime on on production tax, which is one percent of the production will then go to the local community. And there is a grundrentescat, uh, which is a, a, a taxation on the value of the wind, <laughs> in a sense, on hearing uh, right now, that the wind is actually a common resource and we must also tax that. They are also working on how local government could become a formal decision maker in wind power. So we, it's called reintroducing energy in the... Um, Planning and Building Act, but it's not done yet. And then you can say, so this has been working on and it's not done all of it, but with the war on Ukraine, we saw a new motion in the wind power development. Um, what they said is now we need to reopen wind power. We need to build out more energy. We have an energy crisis in Norway. Energy is expensive. 
we need more energy for for green uh, industry. So a lot of the a lot of the, you could say the arguments that had been very powerful ten years ago were suddenly made powerful again with the war in in Ukraine. So now wind power has been reopened. The question is if the changes that has been made now with taxes and with probably Im improved procedures will actually change the way wind power is considered in Norway. If wind power is reopened again now, will we see the same amount of conflict? I think, or well, my analysis is that I think some of these measures that have been done will answer to, to some issues of energy justice, you could say. It's definitely a, a different way of, of looking at energy in the municipalities now that there actually is a tax. tax. So now a municipality will actually get a gain from, um, from use, having land with the wind power development, which it was not before. And if the municipality, as it is now, has a more uh, has a stronger voice and a more formal decision making authority, it will also make it different. It will um, it will make the municipalities able to actually have political discussions and maybe public participation about the the wind power in these municipalities. However. I don't think that it changes the way that wind power is understood in Norway. For whom are we constructing this wind power? Is it a matter, is it still a matter of producing enough electrons that you could send to, to EU uh, or that will fuel um, uh, the, the climate transition in, in Europe? Or is it connected to broader concerns of our society? If it's if if wind power is still sort of on on <laughs> or disembedded, if it's not connected to a local society, a life world, I think that the protest will endure. Uh, so we haven't really discussed for whom should wind power be developed. And I also think that there's a lack of, of political discussion about how does energy and especially wind power as a new energy form and solar power as an emerging energy form should connect it to more, you could say, uh, local, regional and, and national development. Who should own these uh, structures? Um, how should it be connected to a workplaces or the welfare state? Um, could we regulate ownership? Um, and the other aspect is, should it be, should municipalities in Norway or regions just wait for developers to come to them with their development projects? Is that a good way of planning energy? Or should we turn around some of the ideas and say, Maybe municipalities or regions should start making energy society planning and say, where would we, do we want energy? And if we want energy, where is it that we see that it's suitable in a broader societal planning perspective? Because if not, we will just reduce the municipalities to being these uh, clerks for developers that will come with their projects and you have to, to treat them. So I think that even though uh, uh, wind power policies have, have changed, there's still a long way to go before it can be considered more a more just transition. So I think that in, in a Norwegian perspective, Norway has a lot to learn from their previous energy forms. The role of the state in Norway in energy development has traditionally been really strong both in the hydropower and the petroleum sector. There's been very, very strong conditions for, for public ownership and taxes. And the petroleum development was heavily related to, to job creation and innovation and, and industry making, you could say, along the coast. 
So in a way, this story was perhaps forgotten in the new, in the neoliberal era of the 90s, um, but it could perhaps be reinstated in po uh, policies um, along the way. Another issue that could be learned from is, for instance, how can local communities and local government take a more active role in energy development and energy planning? So it's not left to the market or the state, but more kind of a third way. Uh, and we've seen some examples in, in for instance, uh, about community energy in, for instance, Scotland, and where the Scottish government, um, they have taken them away now, but they had a, an, a period where they had a, a policy called CARES, which was a community-oriented policy to give loans and, and knowledge support, uh, institutional support for local communities that wanted to put up local energy to support their uh, communities. And there's been a lot of criticism of that, of course, as well, but it's at least another way of looking at how energy transitions could occur not within a market frame, not within an efficiency frame, but within a more just and, and social connected frame. So to sum up, um, our uh, work and analysis, we try to look at, at the Norwegian policy development as a kind of a limbo between efficiency and justice and, and how institutions have scaled up and scaled down um, government regimes from a more centralized to a localized and maybe a re-centralization now, who knows. But the first period can be called kind of a tech wreck paradigm where wind power was seen as a technological potential that needed more efficient procedures, right? We need good institutions to be able to implement this new technology to be able to harvest more energy. So it was a very apolitical sort of regime. In the 2000s uh, until about 2018, you could say that it was more like a climate capitalistic uh, paradigm where wind power and the market was seen as a key to climate mitigation and, and actually to, to fulfill a Norwegian climate policies. The market was an actor that you had to support and able to drive this uh, transition. Uh, and, and this is also where you had these predictable subsidies. You made these uh, market frames for, uh, for, um, for giving uh, subsidies to people investing in Norway in wind power. The past three years has been kind of a, a crossroad uh, where ideas of energy justice have emerged and everything was halted. Everything was, you could say, destabilized, disassembled territorialized in a way and this opposition actually re in this new re-territorializing a lot of things have changed in the wind power policies it might not be enough uh, yet or it might not be good enough but this at least these you could say concerns of justice at least uh, shake the policy in in Norway what we're seeing now is that we're maybe entering a new phase of, of energy security and, and, and arguments of uh, European stability. The latest white paper in Norway uh, that came out here in um, uh, April, uh, April uh, its headline is how Norwegian energy supply is an important player in stabilizing an insecure Europe. So now energy has been given uh, a role uh, and energy transition has been given a role that is so important that it goes beyond climate, it goes beyond social justice. It's about stability and, and peace. And I think that will perhaps, unfortunately, also fuel some transitions in, in, in the sake of efficiency and, and forget maybe some of the, the issues that that we had actually just uh, achieved. So, so maybe this energy urgency will uh, erode some of the energy justice aspects because we just have to yeah, act now. Yeah, that was it.
forward to questions. Uh, let me just uh, turn off a few things so that we can uh, do that. We can stop the share. That's the first. And then we can also.